Uh, okay, I'll start from the beginning. But anyway, um, <laughs> Richard's a member of the South Carolina Historical, um, sorry, the South Carolina Archaeological Society, the Greenville Historical Society, uh, the Greenville History Commission, uh, which he served on. Uh, he has, um, he retired from Greenville Technical College where he was an instructor in publishing. It has a longer title than that, but I don't understand it, so I'm just gonna say publishing. Uh, he also is, was uh, very instrumental in, the, as I understand it, the largest event the TR Historical Society ever put forth, which was the Spirit of 45, which was about World War II. Uh, he was instrumental in putting that together. He blew up a lot of pictures. He did a lot of interviews with veterans. So he is, uh, his hand was on that though, not obviously so. Uh, so he very much mattered in that. Um, so his presentation tonight is called 10,000 Years of American of uh, Greenville History. So uh, we very much, I very much anticipate uh, his presentation. So thanks. Uh, forgive me because I can't stand, so I have to sit. And guess what? I still don't live near there. <laughs> <laughs> what we're going to cover tonight is from the first people to arrive in Greenville County up until the formation of Greenville County. We're going to start with the archaeological time frames. There are five archaeological time periods. The first one is the Paleo-Indian period, and it dates from 50,000 BC to 30,000 BC. Excuse me, 8,000, excuse me. 50,000 BC to 8,000 BC. The second one is called the Archaic period, and it dates from 8,000 BC to 1,000 BC. The third one is the Woodland period, and it dates from 1000 BC to 1000 AD. The fourth one is the Mississippian period, and it dates from 1000 AD to 1600. And last but not least is the historic period, 1600 to present. Each time could be subdivided down to an early, middle, and a late period. The Paleo Indian period, 50,000 BC to 8000 BC. It is believed that man crossed the Bering Straits onto the North American continent between 50,000 and 38,000 uh, BC during the last ice age. Because so much water was locked up in the ice, the levels of the oceans dropped by 300 foot, exposing a land bridge between Asia and the United States. There are no man-made artifacts ever been found from this time period. At the Great Lakes, there was, the ice was one mile thick. One mile thick. Think about that. Charleston, South Carolina, we know is on the coast. During this period, it was 75 to 125 miles inland because of the water drop. It is during this time that the first, the late Paleo period, 12,000 BC to 8,000 BC. It is during this time that the first man-made artifacts are found on the North American continent. The oldest of these artifacts is a stone projectile point, a spear point, known as a Clovis point. The Clovis point is made up from stone and is very distinct in shape. And we have a picture of a Clovis point, and we will talk about that one that was found in Greenville County. Paleo point, or points are named after an area in which a specific style of point is found or after a person who found a distinctive, distinctive uh, style of point. The Clovis point was found in Clovis, New Mexico. In 1932, it was not believed that the man and the mastodon was on the North American continent at the same time. After a real bad storm, a farmer was checking his land 
and he found the mastodon bone and embedded in that bone was a Clovis point. <coughs> Paleo points are very rare in South Carolina. Only 800 have been found as of 1920, uh, 2022. Points in South Carolina are made from quartz, flint, chert, slate, or other hard rocks. Points are made by flaking, getting two rocks together, knocking off a flake, and then taking, that produces a rough shape, then you take a deer antler and you pressure flake all around it and form the point. How can we tell how old a projectile point is? Archaeologists date things several different ways, and one of the ways they do is known as carbon-14 dating. Everything that was alive contains carbon-14. When it dies, did I lose something? When it dies, it begins to decay, and this decay can be measured so you can tell how old an object is. How about a stone? Was a stone ever alive? No. So how can we date a stone? When an archaeologist excavates a site, not only does he take the artifact itself, but he takes the surrounding material. Somewhere in there, there may be something that was alive and contains radiocarbon-14, therefore dating the uh, projectile point itself. If you, uh, there are, if you find projectile points, or you start finding projectile points, please try and record it and report it either to the Historical Society, there are several archaeological groups in the area. Uh, you, if you take that point and just take it away and say that point had never been seen before, you have destroyed that site. The archaeologist you contact does not want your points. The important thing is the site where it was found. That's the important thing. The Archaic period, 8000 BC to 1000 AD. It was late in the Paleo period and early to the Archaic period that the last ice age ended. Temperatures in what we know as Northwest South Carolina was very different than what we find today. The temperature would have been what, we, what you would find in southern Canada. The summers would be cooler and the winters would be cooler. It is during this time <coughs> excuse me, that man first began to hunt in what is now Greenville County, South Carolina. We know this because of the artifacts that are found in this area. One of the oldest <coughs> artifacts is called a Kirk Point and it dates to about 8,000 BC. So that dates it at 10,000 years ago. The most common point found in Greenville County is called a Morrill Mountain Point. And these points are found everywhere. And they date to 5,000 BC. So by 5,000 BC, people were really coming into the area. It is also during the archaic period that a new hunting weapon was invented on the North American continent. Has anyone ever heard of an atlatl? You know, okay. An atlatl, and I just happen to have one, <laughs> is a cross between a spear and an arrow. The front end is hollowed out, and the rear end is hollowed out. You have what is called a foreshaft. <coughs> This is what contained your projectile point. They would shave it down and it would go into the front. Come on. Of the atlatl shaft, just like that. They then had a platform that has a little notch in it and it hooks to the rear. And you take this thing and throw it, about like a baseball. I can get these out about 100 yards, fairly accurate. The speed of the atlatl over a spear is 15 times greater. The impact pressure is 300 times greater. 
what would happen was when the atlanal shaft went into an animal, the back would bounce off, but your foreshaft would remain. Think about it, would you rather carry maybe two of these and maybe 10 of these or carry about five or 10 spears? This was around for about 7,000 years. So it's a very unique weapon. It's been called the atomic bomb of the paleo Indian period. <laughs> uh, one thing I'd like to mention, back in uh, 1995, a woman came into my office at Greenville Tech. She had a stone axe, and uh, she showed it to me and asked me if I'd come down on her property and do just a site survey, just look over the ground and everything. Uh, myself and a friend of mine, we went down, and we did not find anything. But on the way back, we went by Fairview Presbyterian Church, and we went through the graveyard, and as I was coming down, I saw this marker, William Scipio Payton. Now, I just happened to have a school teacher, ninth grade math, 10th grade biology, made straight A's off of it. His name was William Scipio Payton. I knew it wasn't him because the dates were wrong. So I went into the church and the secretary happened to be there. I told her, you know, I asked her about the marker down there. She said, oh, that's Mr. Payton's father. I said, by the way, Mr. Payton is my husband. I said, well, I haven't seen him since 1964. She said, well, he's at home. I said, uh, I'll call him and bring him over. So he brought him over. He came over, and uh, we started talking. We talk, started talking about Indian artifacts, and I showed him a picture of a Clovis point. He said, well, in 1966, I was putting a pond in on my farm, and we found some Indian artifacts, and one of them looks like this uh, uh, Clovis point. I said, Mr. Payne, I wish it was, but I doubt it. Only two have been found in Greenville County, and they're broken half, and only the base remains. He said, well, let's ride over to the house. So we went over there, and he went in the back room, came back out, opened up a little towel. I could not believe my eyes. That point right there, he had. He said someone had broke into his house and stole all of his Indian artifacts except that. What an idiot. <laughs> oh, I said, Mr. Payton. I said, I do programs on Greenville County history. Is there any way that you would get rid of that projectile point? No, 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 I won't get it. I said, okay. I told him exactly what it was. I said, well, can I do this? Can I borrow it for a week, go to Columbia, get it registered where it was located, and then I'll bring it back to you? Okay. So I did that and came back and took it down to him about nine o'clock in the morning one day. He said, let's ride around Southern Greenville County. So I'm gonna show you some of the old Payton properties down here. I said, sure. So we rode around, got back about two o'clock in the afternoon and uh, I thanked him and he got out of the car and he leaned back in the, I still get chills. He leaned back in the car. He pulled that point out, he said, here, I want you to have it. <coughs> I said, Mr. Payton, this point will never leave Greenville County. That is only the third one. When I took it to Columbia, that is one of the most perfect Clovis points that's ever been found in South Carolina. I said, I wanna ask you a question. I said, not that I would ever, ever, ever get rid of that point. What is the value of that point? Uh, it's about 25,000. $25,000. Well, eventually I know that all my stuff has to go somewhere. So I looked around Greenville and I decided that I would donate the point to the special collections at Furman University. Mr. Payton graduated from Furman. So we got together and we took it out there and we donated it. Now it resides 
at Furman University. How big is the actual? Mm -hmm. How big is it? It's about three and a half inches long. Three and a half inches long. And the unique, the unique thing about a Clovis point, if you look down the side, you'll see a notch taken out. That's very distinctive to a Clovis point. The Woodland period, is during the Woodland period that the bow and arrow was introduced or reinvented in the North American continent. The bow and arrow had been in the European and African continents from about 30,000 BC. It is during the Woodland period that we see groups begin to form into what we know as tribes. We see the introduction of pottery during this time period. We also see the planting of crops and agriculture. The Mississippian period, 1000 AD to 1600. It was during the Mississippian period that the tribes and ter territories were firmly established. It is also during this time that trading was among the tribes and wars for territories. It was during the Mississippian period that we find the mound builders. And I can tell you there's one mound in Greenville. I asked him where it's at <laughs> because we're afraid it'll get destroyed. So we do not announce where it's at. But there is one still in Greenville County. On May the 25th, 1540, the first Europeans made contact with the Cherokee Nation. And this was made by Hernando de Soto near Murphy, North Carolina. The historic period, 1600 to present. We know that prior to 1777, all Cherokee land, all lands within Greenville County were Cherokee hunting grounds. So were the Cherokees the first people to come into what we know as, Green, as Greenville County? I've got a question for you. How many people in here have Indian ancestry? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four. Well, okay, that's five, okay, five people. Now, let me ask you another question. How many people in here have O-type blood? Goodness gracious, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Why did you not raise your hand when I asked if you had Indian ancestry? All North American Indians had O-type blood. If you have O-type blood, you have about a 99 percent chance of Indian ancestry somewhere, or Japanese. The Cherokee Nations. The Cherokees are the Iroquois family of Indians. Their name may come from Choctaw, which means people, uh, cave people, or Creek, which means people with a different language. The, tree, the Cherokees did not call themselves the Cherokees. They called themselves the Anawanya. They lived in a land called Saganagawa, which in Cherokee means land of the Blue Hills. There are three settlements of the Cherokees. The upper settlements or the over the hill Cherokees had villages in Tennessee and Alabama. The middle settlements were in the mountains of North Carolina and the lower settlements were in South Carolina and Georgia. At one time, the Cherokees claimed lands in what is now North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Virginia, and Kentucky. Where did the Cherokees come from? There are several different theories about the Cherokees and where they came from. An author by the name of Frank G. Speck says that he believes that the Cherokees came from the Amazon basin. And he bases this on the basket, basket characteristics of the Cherokee and those of the Amazon basin. Another author, H. Holmes, believes that the Cherokees came from the Caribbean. And he bases it on the pottery of the Cherokee and the pottery of the Caribbean. John Haywood, author, holds the tradition that the Cherokees lived among the Delawares and that the Delaware and the Cherokee went to war and the Cherokee were pushed push south. Because I've got so many theories, I decided to ask several archaeologists which one of these theories 
most likely true. And the same answer for every one of them. No. <laughs> they believe that the Cherokee may have been Paleo Indians and just evolved in what we know as the Cherokee Nation. So were the Cherokee the first people into what we know as Greenville County, South Carolina? This question will probably never be answered. However, we do know when the first people came into Greenville County by the artifacts that are found, and they date to 8,000 BC or 10,000 years ago. On May the 25th, 1540, DeSoto made contact with the Cherokee Nation near Murphy, North Carolina. In 1550, a new tribe arrived in South Carolina, and these were the Catawbas, although this date may not be proven. In 1582, both the Catawba and the Cherokees were using the area between Kiwi, Totsaway, Rock Hill, and Columbia as a common hunting ground. A war erupted between the Cherokee and the, and the Catawba in what, is, uh, what has been called the bloodiest battle ever fought on South Carolina soil. The two tribes fought, but neither could gain an advantage, so they entered into a peace treaty that the hunting ground could still remain as Cherokee and Catawba. However, no permanent villages could be built in this area. Today, we've ne never found any permanent village. We find hunting villages, but not permanent villages. <coughs> By 1674, the population of the Cherokee Nation is 50,000. By 1690, traders begin to infiltrate into the Cherokee Nation. By 1700, the first firearms were introduced into the Cherokee Nation. By 1729, smallpox epidemic hit the Cherokees. In 1730, in a treaty with the British government, all Cherokee lands would come under the protection of the crown. In 1738, another smallpox hit the Cherokee. A very important day. By the way, everybody get a test? Okay, I'm sure. 1739, very important day. The legislative in Charlestown passed an act, number 660, and it states that Indians cannot sell their land to non-Indians. It also forbid settlers to go and settle within the Cherokee Nation. 1753, another smallpox, smallpox epidemic hit the Cherokee Nation. Since 1674, the population has been reduced from 50,000 down to 20,000. And that's mainly because of the smallpox epidemic. In 1755, in a treaty with the state of South Carolina, the Cherokee Nation is swindled out of most of their lands. Only the present day counties of Anderson, Greenville, Oconee, and Pickens remain within the hands of the Cherokees. In 1758, a trader by the name of Richard Paris out of Virginia was trading among the Cherokee. He took a what, what is called a side wife or an Indian wife in the Cherokee Nation and by the side wife he had a son by the name of George. During the French and Indian War, both the British and the French tried to ally the Cherokee to their side. Because of the influence of Richard Paris, they went to the British side. There was an expedition raised against Fort Duquesne, what is now near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. On this expedition, Richard Paris commanded a group of Cherokee warriors. And at the day before they arrived at Fort Duquesne, the French left the fort. The next day, Richard Paris with his band of Cherokees were the first group to enter the fort. They just walked in. I mean, it wasn't any big deal. But he would claim his whole life, the rest of his life, that he was the first British subject to enter Fort Duquesne at its demise. 
1758 through 1768, following the French and Indian War. Richard Parrish is, met, is appointed Commissioner of Indian Affairs for a short time. He marries a woman in Virginia by the name of Rhoda, and they have three children, two daughters, Sarah and Margaret, and one son named Richard. After the French and Indian War, Richard Parrish is on the move. Still trading among the Cherokees, he's moved south towards Cherokee lands. In 1768, Richard Parrish was just with his family moved on to what is known the Great Plains of South Carolina. Today we know this as the Reedy River Falls area in downtown Greenville. Can he do this? Can he move down there? No, he can't move down there. He's in violation of Act Number 660. No, tra no uh, one allowed in, within the Cherokee Nation to settle. By 1773, Richard Parrish buys the land that he has settled on from the Cherokees. Can he buy the land? No, Act Number 660. He can't buy the land either. In November, uh, Richard Parrish was taken prisoner and taken down to the circuit court in 96 and charged with violation of Act Number 660. Found guilty, Richard Parrish was made to renounce his land, to a, a title to his lands. However, Richard Parrish does not give up the lands. He goes right back where he was at. In December of 1773, Richard Parrish, along with his Cherokee son, George, and three Cherokee chiefs go down to Charlestown. The three chiefs deed to George 150,000 acres along the Reedy River in what is now downtown Greenville for 100 pounds. Can this transaction take place? Sure, Indian to Indian. No problem. George Parrish is then sent to England. Four months later, he comes back. When he comes back, he is declared a British subject. So what he does, he sells 100,000 of the 150,000 acres to his father, Richard. Can he do this? Yes. British subject, the British subject. First land fraud in Greenville. <laughs> the action, the action was uh, was okay. In 1775, Richard Pierce continues to live on the land it is settled. He has an Indian trading post, a sawmill, 100 acres under cultivation. He has quite an enterprise going down on the Rio River Falls. Richard Parrish is a British subject, and he is causing problems in the back country of South Carolina. He is captured, taken down to Charlestown, and put in jail. In early July 1776, the Cherokees joined the northern tribes of the Shawnee, Delaware, and Mohawk. They raid frontier settlements in South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, and Virginia. They do this in an effort to push back the settlers that are encroaching on their lands. Excuse me. This was coordinated with the British attack on Charlestown, and the British took Charlestown. A, excuse me, give me a second. An expedition was raised against the Cherokee. By Colonel Andrew Williamson, the first place they went to was the plantation of Richard Paris. They destroyed everything Richard Paris had. Anything of any value, they hauled off and sold it. They sent Richard Paris's wife and two daughters. They put them in an open buggy, buggies headed on to Augusta without any food or water. 142 miles away, they had to fend for themselves. 
This expedition uh, then proceeded into the lower towns of the Cherokees, and they were destroyed. Colonel Williamson then joined General Rutherford of North Carolina, and they marched to the upper towns of the Cherokees. These were also destroyed. In the Greenville County Library, if you want to read about this expedition, there's a journal called the Ross Journal. It's a journal from the time they started until they finished. And the time frame is 8 July until 11 October, 1776. Very interesting reading. In 17, late in 1776, Richard Parrish, because the British now have uh, control of Charlestown, they released Richard Parrish. He returns to his plantation but finds everything destroyed. He then goes back to Charlestown and joins the British Army. They send him to Florida. Parrish served with the British in Florida, Georgia, and Mississippi, and eventually laid in the war coming back to South Carolina. After the war, he filed a claim for his losses in South Carolina. And I want to read you part of that claim, and this is quote. On my arrival there, Charlestown, I was ordered by General Clinton to go to the frontier of South Carolina, there to raise friends of the government, which I completed to the amount of five to six thousand. This armed the rebels from the Savannah River to the Broad River near the borders of North Carolina, destroyed their forts, and imprisoned their leaders to a number of 40, took 3,000 stands of uh, arms, 22 swords, 27 blunderbuss, and a quantity of ammunition. And this service had no longer been completed than a Colonel Inns and a Colonel Balfour came. They took up the command and what they did is they released these prisoners that Richard Pierce had uh, captured, gave them all the ammunition back, gave them all their arms back, and sent them on their way. Here we have just a tweak of history. If it had turned out differently, things of the revolution may have turned out differently. Richard Pierce had these people. These two colonels released them. These people that he released are the people who fought at King's Mountain, one of the turning points of the war in the South. So, you know, it happens. On May the 20th, uh, 1777, with their village destroyed, the Cherokees met delegates from South Carolina and Georgia at DeWitt's Corner, what we know as DeWitt's. They signed a peace treaty in which the Cherokees lost all of their lands in South Carolina, except for a small mountaintop in Oconee County. In July, the Cherokees signed, signed the Treaty of Long Island of the Holston with North Carolina and Virginia. In 1783, Richard Parrish files a claim for his losses in South Carolina. With Richard Parrish's luck, the ship sinks and it doesn't make it. On May the 21st, 1784, the newly acquired lands are open for land sale. A man by the name of Thomas Brandon purchased 650 acres along the Reedy River, including the Richard Paris site. Now he's commissioner of land sales. He bought 640 acres. Guess who the commissioner of land sales was? Thomas Brandon, sold them to himself, and for number two. In 1785, Richard Parrish refiled his claim, and this time it is uh, filed away, and he has really paid real well for his lands that he lost here. On May the 22nd, 1786, a new county was formed from these newly acquired lands, and this county was called Greenville. G-R-E-E-N-E-V-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. We had an extra E. 
Uh, the legislature did not say why they named Greenville, but because of the extra E in there, it is thought that Greenville was named after Nathaniel Green, Washington's Southern commander during the American Revolution. And that takes us up to the formation of Greenville County. I'd like to say one thing about the E's in Greenville. We keep losing them. Paris Mountain, P-A-R-I-S. Richard Paris is certainly named after him. P-E-A-R-I-S. Where are our E's going? <laughs> I have a theory. The town of Chesney is named after the Chesney family. C-H-E-S, C-H-E-S-N-E-Y. Now, how do we spell Chesney today? C-H-E-S-N-E-E. -E -E. They snuck over here and got one of our E's. We want our E's back. Okay, that, com that completes the program. If you have any questions, just holler out. Feel free to come up and look. We've got some uh, pottery up here, the Addle Addle. And uh, these over here are contemporary. I made these myself. I'm a flint mapper. So I said to make artifacts. You learn if you do archaeological work, you will reach a point that the old bones say, you can't do this anymore. So you take up something like flint mapping. Yes, sir. What was the answer to number three? What's the question? If you have other types of blood, you also have. Okay, I didn't mention that. If you have O-type blood, the people in here has O-type blood, you have shovel teeth. Why not shovel teeth? Shovel teeth, the two incisors on the front. If you run your tongue down below, down the back side of it, you'll feel an indention. It can be a small indention or it can be a large indention. But all O-type blood has shovel teeth. I brought across one case that this, this did not apply. I was down on the Rio River Falls doing this program, and this woman says, well, I got O-type blood, but I don't have shovel teeth. I said, hmm? I think I know what you're going to say. Okay. <laughs> I said, well, you should have shovel teeth. She said, no, I don't. I bought these. <laughs> I said, you go back to your dentist and tell him you want to go to shovel teeth. But you have handouts there? Yes, I do have some handouts that shows projectile points. If you ever find a projectile point, you should be able to look on this little chart and identify it. And they're just come up and get you a copy. Yes? You mentioned about the Indian model. Yes. The DVD on the dark corner with uh, Dean Campbell mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. they show some models the base of hogback. Okay. So, are you familiar with those? No, but I'm, I'm very familiarized through archaeology. And that's the only mound that we really know is that one mound. Because Colin Brillo was in that. Uh, DVD. Wesley Breedlove. Huh? Did you say Breedlove? Yeah. I'll Wesley. Yes, yeah, yeah, Wesley Breedlove. Okay, well. Yeah, I know him personally. Oh, okay. And, and he used to say they were Cherokee, but now he's, he's changed his mind. So I've been to him. There's about 30, 40 of them. Okay. Haven't been there. Haven't seen them. And I haven't heard of any reports. Of any other mounds, but I'll check into it. Well, they're in that, they're, I don't know, I'm getting to that DVD. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Are the mounds you're talking about, the Indians, I know that there's one down near Helen, Georgia. I've passed it before. Helen, Georgia? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a big one. Yeah. <clears throat> there was a lot of artifacts that were recovered from that mound. It was put in a museum down there, and when the dam broke, it took them all down the river and none of us were found. Were those burials? Okay, mounds, okay. generally people think mounds are burial mounds. There are some that have burials in them, but generally it's the seat of government that is built on top of that. They would have a house 
And that's what the mounds were used for. I was wondering, you, you mentioned that that was the third close point that had been found around here. What's the count up to now? Is it a lot? In, Green, in Greenville County, three. Okay. <laughs> Only three. But that one is just it's Christmas every day when I see that thing. <laughs> okay, that's called a turkey a turkey tail. Okay, that one's from the mid archaic period, and the clothes is from the Paleo Indian period. It the clothes will predate that about five thousand years. Yes. Any chance of getting that to the closest point travel dress museum? No. <laughs> it's all right. It, it's got its home. Okay. It's got its home. What's the material? Who made that? What do you have? Well, it would be the Indians that were here at the time. That's made out of Allendale Church or Coastal Plain Church, which is found down the coast. You can find some of it around the Columbia area. The most common material used in projectile points in Greenville County is quartz. They like that quartz. And you see material traded in. If you ever see a black one, I can tell you that's out of Tennessee. So it was the material was traded in. So it's best to call them project, not arrowheads. Right, it's not projectile a projectile point. Right. Or small. If you take an arrow, and you take an atlatl point and put it on the end, what it will do, it just nose dive over. And one thing uh, I didn't tell that I really need to show you, when you throw the atlatl, the rear end goes faster than the front end. Help me with that. Huh? Help me with that. <laughs> it does. The rear end goes faster than the front end. What happens, the shaft will flex. It will actually bend over, and about 10 foot away, it'll snap right back straight. You can actually break these. If you've got enough power that you can throw it, you can actually break these in half. The world's record was 850 feet, and uh, a five per Hundred foot, eighty to ninety miles per hour. Okay, five eight hundred. How much feet? I mean, uh, eight hundred fifty feet. Okay, is we're on a record. It's eight hundred fifty feet, but I'll guarantee you, it wasn't made out of cane. No. It was made out of modern materials. Nineteen eighty-seven. So yeah, it's old. Work. So the record's old. I used to belong to the Adelaide Society. They're fun to throw, and hopefully one day we're gonna have a field day. At the museum, <laughs> and y'all can come and throw the animal out. I did that in Montana at a Buffalo Jump. Mm -hmm. They had a field day, and they had it styrofoam. Right, right. And I could not throw it hard enough to stick it in the styrofoam. What I like to do is you get kids up there, and you tell them, you either hit the target or you're not eating tonight. And basically, that that was it. If you didn't kill the game, you didn't eat. Well, maybe you had black eyed peas <laughs> and cornbread, of course, right? Yes. Cornbread Well, thank you all for coming. Enjoy. Thank you.